All right, we are now going into the piece of your work that is the most context dependent, idiosyncratic, and subject to your judgment, which also means that it's the part where you're gonna end up doing the most trial and error. It's, it's really an art. There's a lot of guessing, there's a lot of finding out the hard way, and there's a lot of realizing after the fact that there was something you should have thought of. Um, that's all part of this process right here. And this is a part of the process where you will get better at it, but you will never get perfect at it. You will never be done learning with it. Um, and so this is a part where you're combining the speaker that is you, the speaker of the language that is you, and the teacher of the language that is you. And you're asking those two parts of yourselves to, to, to be in conversation with one another. That is not an easy thing. That is that is significant. So you're really looking for um, a combination of your judgment and strategic planning. This is where we decide how does that competency sound. This is no small question. We've decided that there's a skill we want our students to have in a language. We've decided there's an act we want them to be able to complete in the language. And now we have to ask ourselves what language will they know and when they complete that? What do they need to know in order to complete it? And so you will actually do some brainstorming and it's best if you do this with a pen and paper or with a computer or a phone app in front of you where you can note your ideas because as I say, you're going to apply judgment. So you're probably going to go back through these ideas a few times. The way you think about uh, what a competency sounds like is Basically that you speak to yourself, you imagine a scenario, you speak to yourself, you note down what, uh, what phrases you say, the sort of script, the interaction that comes to mind or the possible interactions, you might create a few versions. And then you decide within that whether you should simplify it, um, which um, chunks of language are going to be the most important, meaning the most high leverage, which chunks of language are going to be the hardest to grasp, you're, then you're going to start getting into sequencing those and scaffolding those, meaning putting them in an order that allows people to uh, work their way up to the hardest ones or helping them when it's hard. Uh, so we'll get into that as a separate lesson, but for now we're going to think about what does a competency sound like and essentially sounding it out for yourself. So I'm going to do a few examples because there really isn't a method beyond what I just said. It's really um, just something that you, that you do as a practice and that you learn by practicing how to do it more effectively or more appropriately for each group of students that you might have. So let me do a few levels of examples. So I have taken the panels of my communicative competency and uh, skill target inventory and I have scrolled them to uh, a sort of an intermediate level what I imagine you might be covering once you have a lot of basic skills down and perhaps when you're not you might use these at the advanced levels but you might be working in advanced levels with learners who know these already. So I've deliberately chosen something that's a little bit tricky so that we can really kind of play with it. And we're gonna talk about a few examples in different languages, but only you know um, the, the true level of your students, what they already know, and only you know the best constructions to choose within your own language. So with an actional competence, um, this is where I like to always start my work. Actual competence is being able to do things. What can you do in the language? What actions can you complete? with the language. So I've scrolled it down to um, regretting. So I'm gonna use regretting. You see that it's already been translated. Uh, we've begun work on translating it into a couple of languages and you will hopefully come up with your version for your language. And I hope that you will add it to this. I hope you will edit this and offer versions in your own language so that we build this as a multilingual resource for lots of different people. So when I regret something in English, let's think about it. So of course, uh, a, a very basic way of doing this, um, if I have very limited languages, I can say, sorry. Or um, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a, an informal sort of slang thing, but it's very simple to say, we can teach our students to say, my bad. 
uh, that comes from African American vernacular English, but it could certainly be an easy way to give uh, speakers with limited proficiency a better way to express themselves. Sorry, my bad. But when we, when we say regretting, we really want to go beyond apologizing. We want to talk about an experience that we, that we regret or an action that we regret in the past. And it's usually a little bit more of a story. So, of course, um, the simplest way we might say that is I regret that I missed the school bus. I regret that I hit my brother. I regret that I cheated on the test. But that's very boring and we don't wanna say that our whole life. So what else can we do? What other, what other spins can we do? What are other ways that people regret things? Well, I wish I hadn't cheated on the test. I wish I hadn't, it's a nice chunk. Of course you can get into, well, this is a past conditional and um, this is a, a contraction and you, you can do more analysis of it, but we really wanna give it as a construction that they can just use and that they just practice in lots of, context. So I wish I hadn't overslept. I wish I hadn't forgotten my homework. What's another way? How about if I could go back, I would, or if I could go back, I wouldn't. Again, lots of complex grammar there, but if we, if we teach it as a chunk and um, learners understand the function of it, that this is what it's saying, what it's doing. It's expressing a regret. Um, we don't need to necessarily analyze all the pieces. If I could go back, I wouldn't hit my brother. Let's get a little fancier. Let's get a little higher level. If I had it to do over again, I would. If I had it to do over again, I would wake up earlier. If I had it to do over again, I would study harder on my own. If I had it to do over again, I would tell my buddy I don't want to cheat. Um, so these are some different ways that we can express the same idea, um, the same action really, but we put it in different constructions and those constructions can have greater and greater complexity. So you know where your students are at with um, what, what phrases, constructions they already know and you can decide which one is in their Next level, they're, they're just about ready to learn it. They'll understand it when they hear it, and then you can just get them to move up a level, what we call the zone of proximal development. So let's just look at this card. We look at it, we see that it's been worked on in, um, in English and in Western Armenian. Um, there's a few other um, translations in the works. So in Western Armenian, um, we have also listed things for, for our limited proficiency learners, things like gach, things like um, merke, which is sort of like, uh, if you wanna say, oh, dang it, or it's too bad. And so those are things that for lower level folks that can help too, because they really show a lot of emotion. They really put a lot of information out there without having to master a lot of words. And some of them are really more like sounds but they put a lot of information out there um, and allow the person to complete the action, which is expressing regret, without necessarily having to be capable of these really long phrases or things like, if I had it to do over again, I would. But we hope they'll, they'll get there. So you decide where they are and which of those they can learn. And then you give them scenarios in which they're gonna practice expressing regret. You give them those chunks they do repetition with it, they get it, they get some frequency with it, and then uh, hopefully we play out a scenario where they express regret, real, or sometimes we want to keep it light, so we might do an artificial example. Um, moving over to discourse competence. So discourse competence, um, and of course I, I would do that for all of these, but I'm just giving you some different types here. Discourse competence is more like knowing how to organize your ideas, knowing how to put your ideas together and how to express the relationship between ideas. So not everything we use in discourse competence even has what we would consider to be a meaning, like a dictionary meaning or an exact translation. It serves a function in organizing ideas. And so sometimes 
those are those kind of sounds. Um, and then sometimes they're fancier words, but often they, they're not something that we can really define per se. So discourse competence is certainly something that everyone needs, but that is often overlooked uh, when we pass on our knowledge of a language. So I'm gonna look at conjunctions. We know that conjunctions is putting two ideas together and saying that they are linked. Um, so that's very open. They could be linking and agreeing with each other or they could be linking and not agreeing with each other. So there's various kinds of conjunctions. So using a conjunction, connecting ideas is the action that we want the student to complete, the learner to complete. And here we go. They can learn how to use and, so, but, however, nonetheless, what's more. So this is a brainstorm that I did earlier about how to, what, what are conjunctions, what do conjunctions sound like in English? And then I've done the same thing in Armenian. Yev, u, al, pait, miain, naev, yetevoch, pait yete, pait sagain, pait miain. These are all possible conjunction phrases in, in Western Armenian. French, e, me, donc, puis, en plus, cependant, par contre, tout de même. These are all different ways, and there's more, but I do a brainstorm, and I think about what does this sound like, and then I design activities where they're going to have to use these. The function is going to be clear to them. They're going to understand, for example, the difference between and and but, or so, and however. Those are different functions, but they're all parts of parts of conjunctions. And then, and then of course, how they're going to get frequency and practice those, and then the scenario in which they're actually going to be performing them, which was probably, that's probably what I was planning back from. Anyway, hopefully I was using backwards planning. So we've done under one under actional competence. We've done one under discourse competence. Let's do one under sociocultural competence. So let's do adjusting for social distance. Now, this is one that's often hard for English speakers to grasp, but you may recognize it from other languages that you know. Um, it does exist in English. It's just a little bit different. Many Latin languages, many European languages, have what we call an informal and a formal you. So uh, we know in Spanish we have tú and usted. In, Sp in French we have toi et vous. And in German, you have du and sie. So this exists in lots of languages, and that's a really good example. It exists in Western Armenian, so we see that here, um, that it can be used here. So we can say tun or tuk um, to show how close we are. So what we're doing is we're showing, I'm speaking to you respectfully because we're not that close. We're, there's something, there's some distance between us, and I'm showing respect for that. Or alternatively, I'm showing a lack of warmth. I'm showing coldness toward you because we are not we're not friends. We're not close like that. Um, that's also something you can do with language. Um, you might have this prescribed to you that this person is older than you, or this person has a higher degree than you, or this person is more respected than you, and so you should put distance. But you might be choosing to put the distance as a stylistic choice to put some additional information feeling out into the interaction. You may want, of course, with social distance to seem closer to people. So, for example, when we see someone on public transit who's a, the age of our grandmother, if we call her grandmother, if we say, hey, grandma, um, she's not our grandma, but we've just, we've just communicated that, like, we're close, we're tight, I care about you. Um, of course, that can be done in different ways. And it's extremely contextual with the society the exact context of the communication, the language you're speaking, and uh, of course the people who are involved in their previous knowledge. So this is not to prescribe any specific way, but this is a skill that everyone needs to have. How do I speak to people to show them that we're buddies? And how do I speak to people to show them that we're not buddies? And so you can brainstorm how that works in your language, and then you can brainstorm some scenarios where they would practice um, changing the, the same content to show social proximity or close or delivering the same content in a different way to show social distance we we're we're different we're we're not that close 
Um, however this works in your language, it's entirely contextual. So I can't prescribe how to do this for you, but this is an example of a thought process that you would do and you would come up with something. So I'll, I'll give you an English example. The difference between saying, hey man, long time no see. How you been? What, what you been doing? And saying, same content, hello sir, how are you today? We haven't seen you in a while. Have you been well? Same content delivered with different social distance. So teaching your learners how to shift the language to do this. So you would brainstorm some scenarios and then that's what would be practiced after they understand the function, they would get some frequency in practicing it. And then it would play into your bigger goals, something that they're going to use to complete their ultimate task and or project. This isn't something that we can necessarily dictate, and it's something that varies from group to group, teacher to teacher, classroom to classroom, day to day. So it's highly contextual, but you build your confidence by practicing. So just practice brainstorming. How does this competency sound? Script it out for yourself, and then go back and decide which chunks of language are going to be the ones that you're going to have your students understand the function of practice for frequency, and then try out in, a, in as authentic a, a context as you can possibly create for them, and then which ones you're going to expect them to master. You'll adjust this for each learner or set of learners that you have according to what they're ready and, and what's just a little bit new for them. Um, and, and this will also build up your repertoire of shifting your language to different levels and different styles depending on the background of the learner that you are interacting with. 